Well, hi there, and welcome to the Highlighter Podcast. This is your host, Mark Icero, and this is the fourth episode. Uh, before I introduce to you today's guest, um, I'm very excited to say that it seems like this podcast is getting really popular. Last week's episode with Heidi had 120 listens, and it just seems like things are going to go up and up from here, especially with this week's guest. I'm very excited to introduce to you Marnie Spitz, and uh, she is a teacher and a wonderful reader and a wonderful human being. Hello and welcome, Marnie. How are you? Hi, Mark. What an amazing intro. It's kind of hard to live up to. Um, I'm wonderful. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. You know, it's a wonderful day and it's a wonderful weekend. And uh, I miss you, though, because, you know, we used to hang out as educators and, and now you've moved away. Can you share a little bit about that? I know. I know. It's um, such a bittersweet transition. I um, have moved to the glowing, amazing paradise of Bend, Oregon, um, which is really amazing um, and really fun. But um, with that professionally um, has come a lot of changes as well, um, which, as you know, those are the ones I'm the most, um, I think anxious might be the right word, but also excited. Um, yeah, so that's where I am now, in Bend, Oregon. I don't know if I oh, sound oh. like I'm from Bend, but. <laughs> <laughs> How's the summer going so far over in Bend? How are you enjoying it? How are your adventures going? They are so great. I take so many naps along the river. I almost bought Birkenstocks today, which was a big a big deal here in Bend. Um, I have learned how to kayak. We now own four intertubes from Costco, so anyone who wants to come, please do. We have tons of bicycles. Um, I'm really good now at riding my bike without hands, which I know is not safe, but I have a helmet. Um, so, yeah, I think I'm adapting to the lifestyle here. It's go, 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 sunshine every day. Um, and lots of really, really kind, nice people. I think everyone's pretty happy here, it seems like. That sounds really great, and I'll definitely try to visit sometime soon. But, I mean, at this point, you're also getting ready for the next school year where you're going to be a teacher. And, um, right. Do you do you have time to read the highlighter at this point? I mean, it seems like you have a lot of time. <laughs> I know, I'm really busy, um, but I'm trying to fit it in, you know, in between yoga and you know, Ayurveda. Um, but I do have time. <laughs> I do have time. I tend to read it out on my new, on our patio outside because it's still light here. Um, it's light till like 10 o'clock, I feel like. Um, and there's summer. It's a season, people, in San Francisco, turns out. I forgot about that. So, um, yeah, I'm making time. Thank well, you. <laughs> I mean, yeah, what, what do you think? Did you have an article that you wanted to talk about from this past week's uh, issue? Well, thanks so much for asking. I, you know, it's, I think there's a lot of the articles you've sent out recently have really resonated with me and they would resonate with me um, any time in my life just because based on the fact that I'm an educator and who I work with and what I believe in, but um, especially with this transition and what um, this means for me professionally in the community that I'm now going to be serving, the Youth from every quarter really especially resonated with me this week, um, just given the kind of the shift that, um, I mean, maybe I'm making too many assumptions, but there's just going to be a lot of changes in um, what my role as an educator is going to look like here. And so I think that one, uh, the, the uh, it stands on equity and what that looks like um, and the concept of, like, gatekeeping um, who gets in and who stays out just really um, especially resonated with me. Yeah, I, so. I do have to say that I was thinking a little bit um, of you when thinking, you know, <laughs> including this article, just because, you know, <laughs> Anna, Anna is from Oregon and you're in Oregon. I know, Central Oregon, um, right here. You, yeah. I know, it's totally. So, but before we talk a little bit more about the article, can you say a little bit more about the shift? Because some people know that you're from San Francisco and that you taught in San right. Francisco, and now you. So, can you do, can we just sort of step back and and sort of talk about how you see so far? I mean, you talk about your new school being great, and then you know your new position being great. But what what's on your mind about about the shift from San Francisco? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, first I want to start by saying that you know when we talk about privilege and, you know, who has to work harder to get where. It's always 
um, I don't want to say like a sensitive topic, but as an educator, like in my time teaching in urban schools, what I have noticed is most of my teacher colleagues are the ones who, you know, grew up in the gate and were teaching kids who aren't yet, you know, trying to get in, right? And so that that on its own is a really um, complicated and complex dynamic. And so figuring out how to navigate that. And so that's, I've been, you know, familiar, for the past 10 years, that's who I've been serving is a school where the majority of my students are um, very similar to Anna. They are going to be first generation college students. Um, they have to prove they're a lot smarter and they have to work a lot harder to get the same access to things that, you know, kids with, with families with money and with educational backgrounds um, have to do. And so now my shift is that I'm going to be in a community where it's it's not so much as, you know, the high level of the the boarding school referred to in um, the article, but it's, I mean, Bend is a really um, racially homogenous community. It's extremely white. Um, and I say that as a as a white woman, um, and I will be teaching specifically um, this intervention program. Um, the school that I work at is where it's located. It's a public school, but it's located in the really um, prestigious part of town, and um, it tends to serve really privileged white kids. But there is a small group, like small percentage of kids who are um, – not necess- not succeeding academically, not um, doing well in the system. And when you look at their demographics, they're all usually the students of color and they're the students who come from lower income homes. So there's obviously a, a gap in terms of what's going on here. And um, so, yes, yeah, so that's what I'm going to be doing. And it's a little bit scary just because there's so much unknown and that for the first time that my students will be in many ways similar to my students um, in San Francisco, but they're yet they're a mi- such a minority in their school population, whereas before in San Francisco that was, you know, the whole school, if that makes sense. Yeah, it yeah, it does. And it just makes me think about the article as well because, you know, here was this this here was this school um going out mm-hmm. seeking, seeking at least racial or maybe socioeconomic diversity and saying, you know, come here, come here. And then right. when, when there was an issue, there wasn't a support system. And right. what I didn't like is that sort of blaming of the student, whereas, you know, other students mm-hmm. might have a second chance or a different placement. And it sort of made me very frustrated just because here is this, uh, here's this girl, this teenage, you know, young woman who is, mm-hmm. is learning, who is sort of making decisions about herself based on just sort of a lack of support. Um, It sounds similar but different, though, from your situation, just because it seems like your new school um, has sort of, it seems like it's definitely moving in the right direction. It's identifying equity as a, as a a real goal. Absolutely. And, and, and probably having more support, um, uh, support there, you know, including uh, your being there. Um, So that's that. Yeah, I mean, that sounds great. I mean, not to put any pressure on you, but it seems like... You know. <laughs> <laughs> if it doesn't succeed, it's all your fault, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I I, think it is, and that's part of the reason why I was really excited about this position, because it really, I felt like it spoke volumes to the school that I'm going to be working at, that they had their eyes on this particular group of students, and it would be really easy for them to just keep doing what they're doing and just ignore the group of students that aren't necessarily thriving. Um, but but I think also just to go back to the article, what it really, it I think it really, it reminded me a lot of that article, um, The Hoarding of the American Dream that you had up in the highlighter a couple, just this idea that I think, you know, at a certain point intentions just don't really matter anymore. Um, <laughs> you know, like a lot of people move to nice communities not recognizing um, that that's limiting, right? Like what schools look like in other places for, you know, younger kids. Like a lot of the actions they spoke about in the article about the upper middle class, no one's intent doing that intentionally thinking they're harming other people. They're just doing what they think, you know, will be best for their families and best for their kids, and they have a certain level of privilege that allows them to do so. And so... I really think 
it, it just speaks to also just this huge gap in awareness of like what actually needs to happen for equity to exist because like you said, just opening up admissions and trying to get students of color from diverse um, neighborhoods and backgrounds isn't enough. Um, and I think that's something that is really exciting about my position, but also very uh, pressure, a lot of pressure in that, um, you know, just creating a program um, isn't enough. And also, is that even the best way? I don't know, because that seems it's pretty isolating, right? Like you're separating you know, a group of students from the rest of their community. Um, so what does that mean for them? How do you message that? Um, so yeah, there's just so many things floating through my mind right now. Yeah, um, yeah totally. I mean, you know, like, um, thanks for mentioning the, the that other article. It, mm -hmm. I, do, I do tend to include articles really pushing, you know, middle and upper middle class white mm -hmm. people and parents mm -hmm. about, Hey, you know, when you are doing this, that means that mm -hmm. uh, somebody else isn't getting a shot. And the hardest part, though, is that you know, I don't, you know, I don't have kids, so it's easier for me to put right. these articles. But mm -hmm. especially, I mean, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is there a way for, let's say that you know, let's say that you're a white parent and you want mm -hmm. and you want more mm -hmm. opportunity. Is the only answer, for example, to sort of not offer the advantages that you can offer your kids. Hmm. For example, my niece is going into um, the college um, process, the college application mm -hmm. process, you know, and I'm, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm there and I'm helping her out and it's wonderful. And so should I, should we not work together, um, you know, right. or to try to promote, mm -hmm. you know, the best opportunities for her? Um, as a teacher, what would you, what would you say about that as far as, you know, you're there and you know exactly what you're there to do. Mm -hmm. But let's say in Ben, mm -hmm. you know, let's say that you're right. talking to some of the parents. Let's say that they ask you that question. What what would you say? Yeah. I, mean, I, have no, I have no good answer for it. Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't either. Um, other than to say, I just think the, um, the connections piece is so important. Um, and actually the program, uh, in the school district is known as connections. Um, and when I say connections, what I mean, it's, it's actually just to go back to our favorite man in the universe, Brian Stevenson, you know, this idea of like empathy and bringing things really close. I think so many students, and it, it means students of privilege and students of not privilege, they operate in these bubbles of like, oh, this is just how the world is, right? No matter, and some of those bubbles are better than others. But, um, I think bridging a gap between what different kids' lives look like so that students of privilege can kind of see, hey, wait a minute, I'm not actually, this is actually, a, like, things I'm getting are really very much a luxury, and I'm not necessarily entitled to that, like, well, like to gain some perspective. And then on the other end, too, um, for students maybe who don't have those same privileges to kind of feel like they have allies, right, and to feel um, like, oh, there's a bigger world out there, like, what their life could look like in a different way. Um, and I just think bridging gaps between students from different backgrounds is, is definitely a really big starting point, um, which is why something I really wanted to do this year with my students in Bend, who I haven't even met yet, but I'm so excited to meet them, is to create some type of an exchange program with my students in San Francisco. Because I just think there's so much power in, in connecting to, to other students whose lives maybe look a lot different than yours. I think it's, yeah, I think it's a great idea because I think that we all think that we know about different people just because access and, and communication is right there, you know, at our fingertips. Mm -hmm. but the, the idea of really knowing somebody and really listening um, and really, I, I feel like if you get to know somebody's story over over time, then, then maybe mm -hmm. you could actually empathize a little bit more. Um, yeah. I, I mean, but then it kind still, of also, oh. No, go ahead. Well, what I was going to say is, like, I – is that the, in, you know, the finite answer? No, I don't, I don't know. Because there's also been, you know, like, that whole This American Life 8 Mile around the kids who kind of got to see the other schools and how that kind of almost backfired. And, and so there's just – but there has to be – I don't know. So I don't know if that's – it just makes me think of how there could be various implications to that. But I don't think there – nothing bad ever happens from 
from empathy and from building connections. So I would stand by that, I guess. Yeah, I like how you make that point. I mean, the idea is all uh, lots of well-intentioned people say, okay, well, the only way to get to to this is if we just mm-hmm. all talk about it. But obviously, yeah. it just really needs to be very well structured. And and uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I, that episode was just so crazy. It just led to more pain and, and mm-hmm. frustration. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and how these little things, right? Like that we don't even realize. And they mentioned this in the article too. How when Anna, she equates not being able to stay at the summer school to not being able to go to college. Right. How there's these little things that we, from the outside, or people from you know in the in the gate. I keep using that metaphor because it's I think so perfect um don't even realize that what an impact that makes on a student's identity um where they see themselves fitting in the world um and and yeah i feel like i had a lot of a wake up call when i went to dc with my students around my own privilege um which i've been very aware of my privilege for <laughs> a very long time but um pretty long story short we were in the white went to go see the white house and uh, there was a huge group of students, white students, all dressed extremely nicely. And they were all taking pictures. And our group came, and we tried to take a, we started to take a picture. And the security guard in the front said we had to move to the other side of the street right now. This side of the street's closed. Um, and we, then he went straight over to the huge group of white students and just said, "Hey, when you guys are done taking your picture, you can cross the street." Um, and I mean, I could, I could write. A novel on that whole event but it just really it it, for me it really embodied like just these you know my students were like what the heck was that that was so racist they were so they felt so targeted um in a way that if i had been with a group of white students um and they had been asked to move to the side you know other side of the street they would not have felt targeted because their color of their skin and they probably would have been able to keep taking their picture because that's you know so I just, I think there's an awareness that needs to, and that, that only happened for me be, being close, if that makes sense. Yeah. So. Yeah. Definitely the Brian Stevenson way. I mean, yeah. the, the thing that I'm always reminded, I mean, the hardest thing about teaching, I, I feel one of the hardest things is that you're always mm-hmm. um, trying your best and you're always so tired. You're always working so hard. And yet every mm-hmm. single every single moment does matter and it's a cliche it does but the idea about being present because that horrible incident you know that you had um mm-hmm. you know has happened to your students many times probably in different mm-hmm. ways. and and you mm-hmm. were to be there you know um was really important and in the same way that anna sort of heard a message by one person mm-hmm. by institution perhaps totally mm-hmm. changed your life you as a teacher, right. um, you know, can also counteract that narrative. What what was really sad in that story is just, you know, that, that one teacher really tried her best and it just didn't work. But that, that doesn't mean that another, you know, with another student or another case, it wouldn't work. Right. It just really, it just, I know. It's such, it's such a sad story for Anna, though. Oh, uh, I know. I teared up so much. And, and then it just makes you think, too, I mean, I'm sure – all of, you know, all the teachers can relate, like you, you know, your students, they come into your classroom every day, and then, and then the school year's over, and then they leave you, and you just, you know, you hope, um, you know, good things happen to them, and you hope that they feel empowered, but um, I, I was thinking a lot about my, you know, students that I don't really necessarily know what's going on with them, and ones that I was worried about, and where are they now, and what happened, and I think what was really poignant about the article, too, is when she talked about how she felt, the the author felt like it was a fluke. All these privileges that she was able to get was a fluke, Um, as opposed to just um, being a right, you know, or, you know, a rite of passage or a milestone, which, um, you know, in the community I live in, you just go to college. That's just what you do, right? So um, it shouldn't feel like a fluke for, for, and it does for so many for so many students, and that's just, you know, I think it speaks to our system, really. Um, yeah, so I don't know, sorry, not to end on a terrible note, but I don't really know the answer to that. Um, but I do think that 
I think uh, reading is one way to kind of start to fix some things well, and learn um, from yeah. each other. The, the thousands of people out there, the thousands of people out there may not know how much we both really think that reading is important. Um, and I wish that I wish we had another hour or so to talk about it. But, I but aren't, you, aren't you going somewhere soon? You know, we have to get off of this interview. I know. Oh God. Your, yeah. What, what's happening? Speaking of privilege, oh my God, I'm going to sound like the most annoying person. Um, I'm going to Italy. But, you know, does not. I just want want the listeners to know this is not like our annual trip to Italy. It's never happened before. It's a once in a lifetime trip. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I gotta, you know, gotta pack up and work on my pasta and gelato appetite. Allora, and say things like well. that. That's very well done. Thank you. Yeah, well, I, I hope, you have a great, <laughs> hope you have a great time, Italy. <laughs> and and Marnie, thank you so much for taking the time to to talk about this article and to talk about um, your teaching and, and what's in store for you this year. Thanks, Mark. Thank you so much. Arrivederci. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> and thank you, everybody, for listening in on this episode. If you have any comments, please just let me know. And you know what? Um, you can always go back and reread this article that we talked about um, over the last 20 or 30 minutes. So feel free to do that. If you want to subscribe to this podcast, you can go to Apple Podcasts. And you could also subscribe to the newsletter if you haven't done so, because that's going to come out on Thursday at 9, 10 a.m. Uh, anyway, thank you so much for listening and have a great evening. <laughs>